Hey everybody, my name is Jeremy Siskin. I'm the author of Playing Solo Jazz Piano and also the Jazz Piano Fundamentals series. Books one, book two, maybe someday, a book three, who knows? And today I wanna to talk a little bit about making your left hand more mobile. A lot of us, when we start playing jazz piano, especially if we're um, you know, trained to play in a group setting with a bass player, um, what we kind of spend the most time doing is keeping the left hand in the middle register, playing some rootless voicings, and then playing a melody with the right hand. And that's all well and good. That's a great place to start. But as I listen to my heroes, whether that's a Mulgrew Miller or an Errol Garner or an Oscar Peterson or um, Ahmad Jamal or you name it, their hands are much more mobile, moving around the keyboard a lot. And in fact, you know, I got to study with Fred Hirsch and I would look over his shoulder and I would just be stunned by the fact that both hands were always seemingly covering something that the other one was maybe leaving off. So I came up with some exercises to move uh, particularly my left hand around the piano more. I'm sure we could come up with something similar for the right hand, but I wanna share those with you now, if that's okay. If not, stop watching the video, I guess. Um, so I guess just preliminarily, I've shared this in other videos and with my book, but I kind of think about three broad positions for the left hand and you know we could debate about like exactly how we want to think about these but I think this is at least a good place to start so the first one I already mentioned is rootless voicings right rootless voicings that should all be one word there's kind of a big space between root and less but we'll we will muddle through so rootless voicings you know if we're thinking about C major then maybe we're thinking about having the third on bottom the seventh on bottom, you know, occasionally we might have the sixth on bottom. So these are what we often do with a bass player because the bass player is playing the root. And the important thing to know about these rootless voicings is that they're staying kind of around middle C. I often kind of talk with my students about the magic range for the third and the seventh of the chord as being between C3 and G4. You want to keep your third and seventh between these two notes at all times. So when we're playing a rootless voicing, we're often hiring, highlighting the third and seventh in that range. If we go much higher, it doesn't really sound like much. It's not really defining the chord too well. If we go much lower, it starts getting really muddy down there. So the second thing is a bass plus a shell. Okay, so the shell is the third and seventh. And the third and seventh, if we're thinking C, they want to stay in that same range, that magic range between these two. But we might reach a bass note, for example. We might be able to reach that low C plus E and B. Or both of those. Or just one of the two notes of the shell. Sometimes we will replace that with the fifth of the chord. But in this mid middle position, you're gonna go, you know, you're gonna have the third and seventh and notes lower. And then lastly, you have a true bass position where you're mostly going to be high highlighting the root of the chords and you're going to be using open sorts of intervals like octaves and fifths. And we really wanted this to be as low as possible. And this is kind of like frequently used as a percussive sort of effect. I often think it's like the bass drum of a drum set. So, the first exercise practices moving between that rootless voicing position number one and the bass position number three. And this is particularly drawing on the work of pianists like Oscar Peterson, Gene Harris, Monty Alexander, kind of these pianists in the Oscar Peterson-y tradition. And what we're gonna do is three measures rootless voicing, plus one measure of a pedal point. And this is really stereotypical of this kind of Oscar Peterson tradition, which kind of count, comes out, in my opinion, of the Count Basie big band. Um, and so let's just pretend we're gonna stay on C, C major. I'm gonna play three measures of C major in a regular rootless voicing position. And then I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna do a five pedal in measure four. So one, two, three, four.
most common pedal that I do, I'm always doing an octave pedal. And the most common thing that I'm doing is going from the top note to the bottom. Usually kind of from the end of one to beat three, one and two and three. And notice I'm adding a little grace note scoop on the top end. So that's the general exercise. Again, practicing getting your left hand more mobile. Now let's apply it to a tune. So here's Ornithology, classic Charlie Parker, Benny Harris tune. Um, and now we're gonna be playing the first three measures with rootless voicings. And then in the fourth measure of each line, we're gonna be doing our pedal. You can't read that. Um, okay, so again, three measures, rootless, one measure of pedal. And in terms of the pedal, I would choose the five of the upcoming key center. So if you look in this next measure, we're going to F major. So here we're gonna do a C pedal. Next line, I think it's fair to say we're going to E flat. So we're gonna do a B flat pedal. That's the five of E flat. Now here it's a little complicated. The first chord is B minor, but if you look at this, it's a three, six, two, five in G. So I would say that the key center is G major. So we, I do the five of that D pedal. I'm not sure there's a single right answer as to like what the key centers are or like what note you should pedal technically. But to me, that's the most clear, efficient way of, of determining it. So let's see how this would look like. Now I'm going to be improvising and I'm going to leave each fourth measure open to do the pedal. I think you could practice it also, and we'll try it. You could practice it where you play through the pedal, but oftentimes that pedal kind of is the focus when a musician is doing that pedal. So let's try it. So one, two, rootless first, two, three, four. typical to put the pedal in the fourth measure because it helps to define and reinforce our typical four measure phrases. Now, just for kicks, let's try a version where I'm going to play with the right hand through that pedal point because I think that's also a good skill. Now you really have to multitask between right hand and left hand. Notice I'm putting the pedals almost as low on the piano as I possibly can. They are there for that kind of an effect to really broaden out the range. Okay. Here we go, let's try it. Same thing, but now I'm gonna play through the pedal points. feels less natural, like the pedal to me, you know, demands a little bit of attention. But that's going to be a really good exercise to get that left hand used to doing multiple things in very tight spaces. Second exercise kind of has a, a bunch of possible variations. So here I'm going to be playing the ands of fours and ands of twos, and I want to keep that consistent. Some of you um, who have studied with me or others might know that we frequently call this the red garland pattern. And this pattern is really important because we're anticipating both strong beats, right? Beat one and beat three of the measure, we often refer to as the strong beats. So the end of four comes right before beat one, the end of two comes right before beat three. So if I'm just doing that in the middle range, sounds. generally don't come up with that kind of consistency, although Red Garland sometimes did. Um, I think it's really useful to plan to be that consistent 
because it gives you a way to say whether you're being successful or you're not being successful. All right, so now what I wanna do is I'm gonna play rootless voicings on the and of four, and then shells, bass plus shells on the and of two. Okay, so remember bass plus shells means I'm gonna play the root or sometimes the fifth maybe. So let me do this um, on ornithology. I'll say one more time what I'm doing because I know it's maybe confusing. I am going to <laughs> uh, be playing on the and of four, my rootless voicing. On the end of two, I'm going to be playing my bass shells. And this is really just giving me a hard time here. Come on, ornithology. Be cool. Let's try this one more time. Sorry about this, folks. If you're not having fun at this point, I just don't even know. Do you even like really poorly produced YouTube videos at all? All right. We're in business. So here we go. I'm going to do it without the right hand first, just so you guys can watch. So starting with G major, one, two, three, four. So that left hand's gotta be really mobile to do that, right? Now let's add some right hand. And by the way, as you're practicing, you might wanna start first just practicing with a head. You know, um... start with the head and then try to improvise. That way you can kind of plan out the coordination with the head. So, but it could also be. start imagining how many different ways we could do this. Um, we could do, for instance, instead of rootless voicing on and of four, bass shell on the and of two, we could reverse those. We could do the bass shell on the and of four and then the rootless voicing on the and of two. We could do a low bass note on the and of four and rootless voicing on the end of two. We could do a low bass note on the end of four and a bass shell on the end of two. that you know we could go bass rootless uh, sorry bass 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 shell rootless bass shell <laughs> let me get these on the off beats one two three I'm 
mental energy. Um, but this, you know, as you master these exercises and as you get more comfortable switching positions in the left hand, you're going to have so many more opportunities available to you. So let me just maybe demonstrate that I wouldn't do, of course, as I'm playing, I wouldn't do anything so formulaic, but I do like to move in between these three positions with my left hand. So um, if I'm going to play ornithology, quality of accents. And left hand is providing a lot of accents. So to move into different positions of the left hand gives us this variety in the feeling of the accent. I know some of you are wondering, would you also do this playing in a trio? And the answer is yes. If you listen to these great pianists, they don't shy away from playing in the lower register when they're playing with the trio. That doesn't mean to camp out there and play a bass line while you have a bass player playing a bass line. That means that for accent and effect, you are definitely welcome to use that uh, lower register with intentionality. All right, guys, thanks for going on this journey with me. Uh, if you stayed for the whole time, put the word chameleon in the comments, like Herbie Hancock or like the shape, the color shifting lizard. And you'll love my books, which are all available on jeremysiskin.com, Jazz Piano Fundamentals, Jazz Piano Fundamentals Book 2, and the second edition here of Playing Solo Jazz Piano. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.